Good morning, it's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, August 25th, 2020, and this is 10 on Tuesdays. Our special guest today is tax attorney Tim Shalley of Michael Best and Friedrich Law Firm. I'm Holly Hoffman, founding partner and CEO of the Sales and Income Tax Advisory Network. Prior to creating my company, I worked for the Wisconsin Department of Revenue as an auditor, speaker, and sales tax specialist. My passion is to help provide sales tax education and support to tax professionals, businesses, and associations with the goal of building a network of empowered taxpayers. So for more information, visit salesandincometax.com. Thank you for joining my web chats, 10 on Tuesdays, every Tuesday from 10 to 1030 a.m. You can check out previous episodes on my mm -hmm. 10 on Tuesdays channel. To find my channel, go to salesandincometax.com and look for the 10 on Tuesdays logo. Click on the logo to register or click on watch previous episodes to access the 10 on Tuesdays channel. So I'm very honored today to introduce my guest, attorney Tim Shalley. Tim provides counsel on a variety of tax matters, but is one of the foremost experts on Wisconsin sales and use tax for retailers, manufacturers, and construction contractors. He regularly represents taxpayers with complex tax matters in administrative appeals and in litigation before the appeals, the Wisconsin Tax Appeals Commission and the Wisconsin Appellate Courts. Tim has a strong track record in his court cases against the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. Tim has received recognition by a variety of organizations as being a super lawyer, lawyer of the year, leading lawyer, and more. He's got it all. And I'd say it's fairly unanimous. Tim has also <laughs> written the, com <laughs> the Complete Guide to Wisconsin Sales and Use Taxes. And I know that many of you are quite familiar with his book. In fact, it was one of my listeners and clients who reached out to me and told me that I needed to write a book like Tim Shalley's. I don't know why I'd do that because Tim did a good job. I had heard Tim's name often when I worked at DOR and I just couldn't help but want to meet him. So I reached out to Tim the next day to invite him on 10 on Tuesdays. Several conversations later, here we are, Tim. I got you on my show, so I'm so appreciative. Um, and the Complete Guide to Wisconsin Sales and Use Taxes is not the only book he authored. He also wrote Wisconsin Business Taxes. If you're not familiar, you should look at that one also. It provides an extensive examination of all Wisconsin business taxes. And I know I didn't do you justice with your introduction, but welcome to our show, Tim Shelley. Well, good morning, Holly, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for the kind words. Great. So I want to start with your book, since that was the impetus and someone bringing that up to me and, and reminding me that it's a good way to provide education and support to people. And so since that, that's why I mainly brought you on today's show, I want to start there. So many accountants refer to your book as the Sales and Use Tax Bible. I don't know if you know that, but that's what they refer to it as. Um, when anyone talks about the Bible, we know what they're talking about. It's very thorough. So can you discuss <laughs> yep. the process of writing and updating your tax books? Yeah, uh, the book was first published in 1993. And just stepping back a little bit from that, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Law School in 1985. Um, I've been with Michael Best and Friedrich ever since then. Uh, a little footnote is one of my law school classmates was Mark Zimmer, who's one of the lawyers on the Department of Revenue's legal staff, and a very, very good lawyer and a very bright guy. Um, but in any event, back to the back to the sales tax book, it was pu first published in 93. It's been uh, updated, revised, republished many times since then. And, the, and I'm in the process now of revising the whole book uh, at this time. Uh, but it, it, although it was published in 93, the process of starting to write it, it began well before then. And, and it wasn't just me. Um, our tax group worked on this book probably starting in the late 1980s. Uh, and the process in any writing of any significance is basically is the same. It has the same rhythm. Um, in, in this particular case, you know, we had for years put on a seminar on Wisconsin sales and use taxes. So that when you do that, and it's a comprehensive sort of survey seminar, you get a feel for the whole area. When you do it multiple times, you get the repetition of looking at the same stuff over and over again, reading the cases over and over again, and so on. Uh, so that laid the foundation and sort of got the groundwork for uh, 
the, you know, the issues, how to structure a book, what, how, what the chapters should look like. That thinking got done. And then once you do that, then you have to, before you start writing, at least this is my technique, you have to read everything. Um, it, it's, uh, you collect the materials. You have to be patient, uh, disciplined and patient. Now you collect all the materials. Um, and, and only then, once you've got them all together, uh, and there's a lot of them, when you do something like the sales tax, which really had its origins in Wisconsin in the early 1960s, uh, there's a lot to go through uh, as things have evolved. The statutes, how they've changed, the rulings, the cases, the revisions to the statutes, all those things. And then, and then all of a sudden, then in 2009, they're streamlined. So, which, which, which in some respects, a lot of things stayed the same, but a lot of things changed. And even the things that seem to stay the same are, are more nuanced now. So in any event, uh, read everything, read it again, uh, go back to the outline and start writing and uh, be prepared to spend a lot of nights and weekends on, on it uh, over years. You know, a good Stuff. And I'm not set, set aside the question whether the book is good or not. Any anything that's a comprehensive project like that is going to be a massive investment of time. And there's going to be times where you, you know you you don't want to do it. Uh, sort of my philosophy on it was that those nights when I didn't feel like working on the book, I would try to do something. Check the footnotes, check the sites. You know, more tedious things where you that take time, but where you don't really have to be thinking. Um, hard and reading cases and so on, but just keep it moving. Just keep the process going. And what really helps, when, which is the case with the, the Michael Bus sales tax book, we had several people working on it. So, and we, we would exchange, we would write our chapters, we had schedules, we would you know, inevitably go past the deadlines we had set. They were internal deadlines though, not publisher deadlines, but just keep working, keep pushing, uh, and then exchange the chapters, read them, uh, comment on other people's work, uh, and get a lot of dialogue going there. There's no substitute for that. Uh, any publication, whether if you're if you're authoring it by yourself, you don't have that. You know, you need reviewers, and yeah. ordinarily you'll get that from the publisher. Uh, but it really helps to have other people reviewing. And to, you know, often at the beginning of a book, you'll see a footnote that says, you know. Uh, thank you to all these people who read all this stuff and commented on it. Um, <laughs> it vastly improves the price. And believe it or not, uh, there have been times when I've worked on pieces of this, say some of the updates, where I've sent them to the department uh, prior to publication. Um, you know, some of the Mike Kinnendale, who's retired, Janet Abrams, who's retired. Uh, I would send some of these materials to them and, and they would comment on them. Ask me to tone it down a little bit, you know. Um, those, those kinds of things, but they provided helpful comments too. And, uh, which kind of goes to a, an overall point here. I, I've, I found over my career, uh, that, that, that we have a really good department of revenue. Um, uh, just speaking on the sales tax side, and I do a lot of other, I do income and franchise taxes. I mean, you know, you name it, state and federal, uh, sales tax is a, is a, is a, a material piece of, of what I do. But I've always found, I shouldn't say always, but I think, you know, the lasting memory and sort of overview thought is that um, at the technical people at the department in this area have always been very helpful. Um, they, uh, when, I'm, uh, when I have an issue uh, in a planning context, not audit, but planning uh, that I struggle with, I do my homework, kind of lay out what I think the analysis should be, and then call, you know, call uh, it, the various people, two I've already mentioned, uh, and just talk it through. And I've always found people, they try to come up if there's a roadblock where, yeah, this looks like it's going to be taxable. Let's try to find a way to work through this so that we can find a structure, a planning structure, maybe using multiple entities, whatever it might be. Um, reconfiguring some, you know, looking at the rulings. Is there, is there a, like a, an, a, an angle here where we can get to a non-taxable or a more favorable result? Uh, 
I, that, it's just been a great experience. Um, I can't say that it, that's been the case with other departments of revenue. Not, but you know, here you get phone calls back. People I found to be honest, they're helpful. Um, you know, that's more on the planning side. Audit's a different issue. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's a it's a different process. Right. So, um, and 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 then in any event, once you write the book, uh, then you got to update it, and uh, that's tedious. I mean, it's. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, and I'm working on that complete rewrite of the book right now, and and um, uh, just I'm just plugging away at it. There'll be a new chapter on digital products, because that's one of the things that comes up in audits all the time right now. Just that whole area, it's of yeah. of intangibles. It, what we what we would commonly think of as intangibles, software, which um, can be considered tangible property under the definition under Chapter 77, but uh, but so if it's not, if it's customized, it's not. But in any event, it's sort of an intangible. But inevitably, it's that's associated with digital products. And in a, that's inevitably associated in some way with SaaS, software as a service, platform as a service, PaaS, infrastructure as a service, IaaS. You know, what are those things? Are they yeah. taxable? Are they not? Are they uh, inevitably those those items? Uh, when they're sold, not inevitably, but frequently, when a seller sells a product, there's pieces uh, to it. Some, you, you look at, you say, that, well, this in the old days, this was a non-taxable service, no problem. And in fact, audits come to me that way, where, you know, sellers in other states looked at Wisconsin law, they went to RIA Checkpoint and some of the the services and looked at the Department of Revenue's tax releases and Bolton's. They concluded it's not it's non-taxable. They didn't charge tax. They built that pricing into their long-term contracts with their customers, and then the department comes in on audit and uh, starts raising these questions. And I, and fairly, I mean, these are hard issues. I, I the department right. knows they are. They they agree they are, but when you get these components mixed together and you look at what used to be a non-taxable clearly a non-taxable product and you start picking at it. Well, here's a little email. Oh, oh there's an email, right? Oh, they send updates. Uh, there's no separate charge for the updates. Oh, there's, there's no separate charge to, for the email. Um, how is this delivered? Oh, this sounds digital to me. Is this an information service? Yes. Uh, and so then you, and then you get into the, so then you get into the bundling rules and, uh, in the before time, kind of before streamline, uh, there there was wide application of the principal purpose test, primary purpose. Then you got into from whose perspective is the principal purpose test determined, the seller or the buyer? And those issues, they weren't easy issues, but it was the devil we knew. Now we have uh, the statutory bundling rules uh, through streamline. And whether they're they're not so new anymore. I mean, these are 11 years old, but they feel new. Mm-hmm. And I think we're and we're all there's always a lag between statutory enactments and audits, and then appeals. And uh, my experience these are, these come up in a lot of audits is everybody's struggling with these, uh, you know, and everybody wants to get to a good result. It, it, there's there's always the mating dance and audit. Um, you know the issues are raised <laughs> the the issues are raised um back and forth on them confusion um typically i'm consulted not i'm normally not retained to handle an audit at the beginning i mean you guys know that that's a lot of that work it's it's important work but it's time consuming and it's tedious um right. the in, the invoice sampling going through line items, is this taxable or non-taxable? Do you have your resale certificates? Do you have your exemption certificates? Going back to the buyers, going to the sellers, trying to prove up whether tax was collected, all that stuff. Uh, people don't seem to want to pay me to do that. <clears throat> so, but what I'll get, when I, and that's fair, I under, that's, that's fine, that's good. Uh, but where I'll typically get the calls is when um, issues start coming to a head. Like, oh, we've got this product we sell, and the auditor is saying it's taxable. Well, then you, you know, you, you and then I get hired. 
And then I yeah. start working through the issue. And then you find out, well, maybe the auditor really isn't necessarily saying that. It's like the auditor is just poking around at it. Um, and then you get a little dialogue going. And uh, and then uh, and then there may be a roadblock. But at that point, um, Holly, as you know, there's there's a process where you can request the technical input uh, or the auditor can, I guess, and the supervisor from the technical services staff, and they write it up. And if the process is working correctly, they'll provide their write-up of the facts to the taxpayer, and you review it, and you give your legal position, and it gets sent in. And then months pass because these are hard issues. Yeah. <clears throat> and then often, yeah, and then often, you know, I, I can't quantify the, the, the percentage of the time this happens. But while they're, while things are sort of in process and waiting, you know, the audits get old, people get tired of them, and then ultimately you get to the end, uh, toward the end, and you're still struggling with these issues. The supervisor gets involved, you have, and then you, and then you resolve it. And unlike a lot of states, and unlike the IRS and income tax audits, for sure, uh, Wisconsin is good in that you can almost have your sort of mini appeal at the end of the field audit, um, let's just say it's a field audit, where you, you sort of do your closing conference, you do your bargaining and negotiation, and you close it up at, at the field audit level. It's not perfect. Nobody's ever really very happy, but um, I think it's great. And this, it wasn't always this way in, in my career, probably only in the last 15 years or so, eyeballing the time but where you get to the end of the audit, then you have people like uh, Alex Prost, who used to is an old you know, old resolution officer, yes. uh, grew up on the income and franchise tax side within the department, but now he's in sales and use. And when you get to the end, you know you, Alex has that resolution experience. You can kind of kind of come to something. Um, people have a day job; they want the audit done. Yeah, they think they're right. There's passion on both sides. Everybody, calm down. Get get back to breathing at your normal rate. Let's let's find a, a way to resolve this stuff. Do you really want to litigate it? I talk to clients about, you know, the risks and the costs of litigation. Um, if you're on and and it's it's a dynamic process. It's it's um, you know I sometimes liken it to a Rubik's cube. Um, if you if you re know or remember what those things are, you're you're not going to solve the whole thing. But if you can line up a few sides, uh, get the colors to match on a couple of three sides, often that's enough to to move on. Um, and uh, it, it, Holly, you and I have talked about this. I, yes. um, on the legal side, there's all, always the factual issues. If you have a manufacturer, you know, for example, exclusive and direct use, when does the manufacturing process begin? When does it end? Is this storage outside the manufacturing process? Is this machine? Is it specific processing equipment? On and on and on and on and on. Okay, so it's, it's, a lot of those things are factual. Some of them are legal. Um, the legal issues, you, get, you can litigate factual questions. But at the end of the day, I, I was just, in fact, I looked at this yesterday. Uh, how many cases on the sales and use tax side in Wisconsin actually get litigated before the Tax Appeals Commission? Now there, you know, petitions get filed, and then, but then those a lot, some of those cases settle. But how many cases are litigated to con conclusion? So I went back, I looked 2016. There, there, uh, and I did this fairly quickly. But I think between that quick look I did yesterday and my memory, I, I, and the work I do in this area, I got this about right. In 2016, there was one case on the sales and use tax litigated to conclusion before the commission. That was the health healthcare services group, and ultimately that was appealed to the circuit court, and then up to the court of appeals. That case is done now, and that department prevailed in that one. 2017, I didn't feel find any. 2018, I, I think there was one. That was the uh, waste treatment facility case, PMFC Holdings. Uh, yeah. Two th yeah, 2019, I think there were three. Um, Citation Partners, which was that new air, the, involved that new aircraft parts and repairs exemption. Uh, the State Bar of Wisconsin case, which uh, an interesting case that came out last fall. And then the Zimmer U.S. case, which was uh, 
uh, prosthetic devices and, and uh, whether their toolkits qualified for exemptions. But, but, and then 2020, there was national plant lease just came out in July. That, as I remember, I, I, I didn't reread it. I think that's more a refund type procedural case. But that's that's five, six cases. Mm -hmm. So the the bottom line on this thing is that most everything does get resolved. Almost everything does get settled. I'm brought in in the context of field audits, and of course, it you know once there are assessments, the taxpayers want to appeal uh, to, to petitions for redetermination to the department, and then from there to the tax appeals commission. But but my job is is harder than litigating a case. It's to try to find a way to settle it. I mean, if you, if you just follow the normal process through, the boat floats down the river of its own accord. There will be an audit. There will be an assessment. You will have 60 days to file a petition for redetermination. You will either agree or disagree. There will, if not, if you can't agree in full, there will be a denial, at least in part. You, you just can keep filing the papers. You right. can just keep you, you can just keep going and litigate your case. The the really hard thing is to configure the various pieces um, after you do after you do your homework, uh, and that and that's pivotal. Um, you know what you know and how much you know is the gold standard in being successful in this area. So after you do your homework, is to configure the value pieces in a way. That's good enough. So, you know, won't be perfect, but whether it's most times, but whether it's good enough to get it done, and that almost always happens. And again, that that's that's hard. Um, yeah. It does require the mate, the mating dance and and so on. But um, when you but have it, but these it, but cases, anyway. when you have these cases, I just want to ask a question because I've said this many times before. Most assessments are on use tax, not on sales tax. Um, people generally have their sales pretty nailed down. And I have a question in from someone in the audience. And they said, do you tend to represent sellers on these issues as the dollar amounts are too small on the purchase side? So are, what, what do you find? Are you representing um, businesses um, for purchasing issues or generally sales tax issues? Well, 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 both. Well, both. And, you know, and I don't know, I wouldn't say that the use tax audits I get involved in, at least, uh, those can be quite substantial. Um, yeah. it, it, because sometimes these, especially these difficult, I have several right now, where there are these difficult uh, electronic intangibles type things, uh, SAAS, software, <clears throat> email, all these bundled things. Where those are buy side, I mean, those are the purchasers are, are sometimes get audited on that stuff and buy a lot of that stuff. But you know, I, I've always said it's easier if you're on the sell side. It's it's easier, generally speaking, to get to a resolution of the case, <clears throat> and that's because again, generally speaking, of these little value pieces you have to configure to try to get a case resolved. What's one thing a seller has uh, that they can offer if the department thinks something's taxable? And that's going forward. Not, don't call it compliance. That's the department's word for it. That colors it a little bit. <clears throat> but if the department thinks it's taxable, you know, when, when, I, when I'm representing a seller, their, their mantra is often, look, at all, we don't really care. <clears throat> we just don't like paying money out of our treasury. So... And this, especially in a planning context, if there's any doubt about it, um, let's collect the tax. And that's that sort of segues into a different area, which is asking for rulings and technical advice in advance so yes. that the seller has something from the department they can wave around with their customer saying, you know, we're not just collecting this because, you know, we're just doing it because we're protective of the state and we want to do what the department says. We just, there's a concern here. We went to the department, we did our homework, we got their answer and we're gonna collect it. And if you wanna challenge it, challenge it on the, on the use tax side. So th again, that's, that's an advance, but even in audits, when you get down to the end and you have your various value pieces, uh, you know, some of those pieces 
in, include, you know, the audit period in front of you. There's always the stub periods. Um, you know, can you get that audit run up to current, which everybody seems to like, isn't always easy to do. And then there's the going forward. Um, you know, if so if sellers say, hey, look at, you know, here we have this and this and this and this, you give us this, we get that, you know, and let's bring it up to current and we'll tell you what to sweeten the pot. We don't like it. We'll start collecting going forward. Um, that's an important value piece. Now, yes. you got to be careful. Sellers have to be careful with that, too. Be I had a seller that that went that route and then they then they went back and, and not not at the time after the fact they went back and looked at their contracts they had several long term contracts with customers uh that had built in pricing where they weren't allowed to collect the tax um under the contracts as they then existed so you got to be a little careful with that um from the seller's point of view i'm not sure what it changed the settlement in that case but um but it, it, going back to the question sales use i i mean i I see it on all sides, you know, but the, the use tax audits, you know, they, they do present their challenges. I mean, that's where you get these line item, you know, reviews. What did you buy? What is this? It, you know, what, it, it, you know, what is the nature of the thing that you purchased? Is it taxable? Is it non-taxable? You know, was, was tax remitted? It's not on the invoice, uh, but was it built in to the price? Does it include it going back to the purchase orders maybe to see if tax was included on it? Um, in some cases going back to the vendors, you know, that's, that's just very tedious work. I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, I want to talk to you kind of some of the things that you were talking about and then a couple more questions that, that people wrote in or comments. Um, you and I, before we started today, we're just talking about that this, the information that you're providing and talking about keeping good records and detailed records and um, good tax decisions, good planning, talking to the department, verifying tax treatment in advance. All of this we were talking about is not just good for preparing for audit or during audit, but we were talking about if you're looking to sell your business, um, things like that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I mean, that's where I find, let's say I'm representing a seller of a Wisconsin business. I might be on the buy side as a lawyer too, either way. But let's just take that fact pattern. I'm representing a seller. Buyer comes in and, you know, the buyer uh, looks at tax compliance. That's one of the due diligence things that they do. And inevitably, if it's any material size of a deal, they'll have uh, sometimes lawyers, but more frequently, one of the accounting firms will come in and scour the books. And those audits, those due diligence audits the buyers do, in my experience, can be much more comprehensive than the one that, that was the Wisconsin Department of Revenue does or the revenue departments of any other state. Again, keep in mind, these it's, it's, it's not uncommon, but you know, most businesses operate in multiple states or they sell into multiple states. So that you get the multi-state tax compliance. Now that we have Wayfair, you get into, you know, sort of those issues with, you know, are you collecting? Uh, have you, and so on. And these accounting firms prepare these amazing due diligence reports. All right. You know, there's these sales. You haven't, uh, we, uh, there's no exemption certificates on file, even though it's like a wholesaler. The seller's a wholesaler, and, and we get this due diligence report from the buyer's accountant saying, yes, it, we know it's a wholesaler, but you don't have all your resale certificates. So we've recommended to the buyer that they create an escrow uh, in the event of, of audit uh, of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to cover that, which then effectively reduces the amount the sellers might get in the sale. <clears throat> so, it, it, and that's, and that's just a simple case. That's just one example of these resale certificates. But all these issues that you see, if there's a construction contractor, the real versus tangible personal property classification questions, manufacturers, all the issues that you see on audit, and then some, um, you know, all the digital products issues, not just Wisconsin, multiple states, SAS, PAS, uh, 
uh, software, how it's taxed in different states, software maintenance contracts, all those things. So I'm, I, I cringe. You know, it's just like, you, you know, a, a Department of Revenue audit is thorough and as good as it is. is nothing like when you go to sell this a business or buy one and, and effectively go through, in some cases, a much more rigorous audit than you ever get from the state. And the rubber really meets the road because it impacts the purchase price. Right. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe we used up our half an hour already. You and I laughed about how fast this time would go. But I really enjoyed our conversation. I think this has been one of our best episodes yet for sales tax. So attorney Tim Shelley, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. There's so much more we could discuss. So I hope you consider coming back again in the future. Be happy to. Want to go another couple hours right now? Uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just... I know I see some of the people in the audience. I bet they would too. But um, next yeah. week, I will be unavailable to host 10 on Tuesdays. So we'll have our next episode on September 8th. And I'm in discussions with all new guests. So follow Sales and Income Tax on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter to receive updates and reminders about 10 on Tuesdays topics and guests. And to rewatch this episode, I mean, we talked fast. So to rewatch this episode or to view previous episodes of 10 on Tuesdays, go to salesandincometax.com. Check out my 10 on Tuesdays channel, and I will see all of you next week. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Have a good day.